Good morning. Welcome and welcome back to Bookie Monsters. My name is PK. It is Monday, January 15th. A lot of people have the day off for the holiday. No mail, no banks. But I do. I do have work. Service work does not end. I hope you guys had a good weekend. Good morning, Mary. Miss seeing you all. No internet for several days. Oh, no. Back now so I can tune in. Hope you are all well and warm. No temps have been crazy. No. Yes. Yeah. Let's see. Saturday morning, we had negative 30. Not wind chill. Uh, yesterday was in the negative 20s. Currently, it is negative 7. Negative 19. Uh, but it's supposed to break today. We're supposed to get up to positive one. And then tomorrow, supposedly a high of 20. So we will see. We'll see. You guys are staying nice and warm and cozy and read good books. Morning, Cajun. Hope everyone is safe and warm. Absolutely. Even if you're in a warm temp, it seems like it's uh, been this winter storm has been making its way across the country it is winter it happens <laughs> uh let's see i am currently reading we had a really good um was it saturday it must have been saturdays hang on copy was required um the the sprint on saturday um i got a couple inspirations uh one you know emily has been reading the count of monte cristo um a few pages every day to get through it and i thought that's a really good idea and i wanted to do that because there's been some really big books that i've wanted to get through and i decided to read uh the sun and splendor by sharon k penman and so i'm going to be doing getting caught up on that so i figure um with the length of the Kindle I book, I have uh, seven pages a day, so I got some catching up to do. Mary said, we had snow this morning. Well, what is passing for snow? A light dusting, which looks like someone dropped some powdered sugar around. I bet that's really pretty, too. That's the kind of, you know, and then it goes away. Cajun is supposed to get down to around 17 here Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Burr! Burr! Uh, the other inspiration i got from the weekend i had never heard of this is uh people are doing genre blankets either knitting or crochet and uh for each book that they complete they do a, a row in the color of that genre each genre has a different color of yarn and uh, at the end of the year or whatever period you're doing you have this blanket of multicolors, but each color represents the kinds of books that you read. I thought that was really cool. I've also seen, there's a Facebook uh, group that, that does this. They are doing squares, uh, and the color of yarn is taken from the colors on the book cover. So people are very clever. I thought I would do that. So I had fun ordering. It was an excuse to order yarn. I admit it. I admit it, because there was some colors I was wanting to do. And uh, so I'm going to be doing that. I've been reading Remarkably Bright Creatures by Sandra Van Pelt. That's the one with the orange octopus on it, isn't it? It is very good, unlike the Come Sundown by Nora Roberts, which I finished disappointed in. Yeah, Nora can be hit and miss. I love J.D. Robb. I don't really like her current contemporary stuff. That's just me. I'm intrigued by the genre blanket, but I'm not crafty. I thought I might do my reading spreadsheet. There you go. The color of the font or the background. There you go. Ways to be you are creative. But I get the not crafty. Um, so books I'm reading. So I'm reading. I started the Sharon uh, K. Penman. And uh, good morning, Sherry. Um and the historical mystery I'm meeting right now is what I've been meaning to get to. It's uh, the right sort of man, the right man, the right sort of man uh, by Montclair. Alison Montclair, first in the series, uh, set right after World War II in England. And in the author's foreword, 
she uh, says her inspirations for the two female leads. Uh, the first one is a young Catherine Hepburn. And if you've ever seen the movie Stage Door, the author has captured Catherine Hepburn's speech and intelligence perfectly for this other for one of the characters. It is it is awesome. That's a very good idea. Hey Sherry. Hey me. It's awesome. All righty. Should we jump into this? Now the page that I go to normally for cozies is still having like um some kind of technical issues. So I instead of you guys staring at an ugly main page here, I'll show you. Whoa, not pretty. Um, I'm going to, I have just opened up each one of these individually and we will go this way. So let us see. Cozy's out this week and we will check the dates. Whispers in the Winter Frost. That's a pretty cover. Uh, first in the Mystic Moonhaven Mysteries, 45 pages. We're looking at the cover. Very pretty. But I'm sorry, 45 pages is a short story. But it did get released yesterday. If you have five and they're only 45 pages, put them all together. There's your book. Pet peeve, sorry. Here we go. Wedding Cakes and Wishes by Christine Pope, sixth in the Lattes and Levitation. We read this one already. Sky O'Malley. They tried to confuse us. Uh, Blotto Twinks and the Phantom Skiers by Simon Brett, 13th in the Blotto Twinks series. 194 pages. Out. When was it the 11th? 11th? Hang on a second. We need these. Apparently I've not had enough coffee. All right, let's try these. Let's see what happens. There we go. Nope, oh, that's February. <gasps> that was January 2nd. I'm starting to not have faith in this website. Here's one. Deliver us from evil and the six o'clock news. Now that I can get behind. <laughs> First in the Brentwood Women Mystery Series coming out tomorrow. Hildegard Hildy Brentwood, a 50-year-old university PR executive at Gulf State University, is faced with her toughest assignment. Discover who killed her faculty friend Adrian and student assistant Bobby before the university and the police shut down the investigation, labeling Adrian guilty of murder-suicide. She enlists the help of her CEO mother, Victoria, and her investigative journalist daughter, Grace, to comb through the possible suspects. Adrian's mis misogynist, this misogynistic department chairman, her violent ex-husband, a smarmy journalist, or perhaps someone from her past involved in her 20-year-old rape. They uncover myriad secrets in both Adrian's and Bobby's past, any of which could have been motive for murder. Taking on the university leadership in the campus and Houston police departments, Hildy is attacked and threatened before they uncover the truth behind the violent deaths. Hildy and her family look into the highest and lowest realms of Houston to find answers with a little help from their fur buddies, etc. The Ides of March, not March, not well known as uh, January, not as well known as March, or should I say as infamous as the one in March. Indeed. I know. It just goes, it's just crazy. 
Sundown at the Saloon, third in the Ghost Town Mysteries by Jamie L. Anderson. Cute boots. I live in Montana. I have never, ever worn a pair of cowboy boots. Lily Cranston couldn't be happier with the way her life has turned out thus far. Managing the Calico Rock Mine and Ghost Town in her hometown of Grady, California is a dream come true. Employed by the city she and her sisters grew up in gives her a sense of belonging and stability. Like a well-oiled machine, the work of her faithful and dedicated staff allows her to spend more time with her hunky boyfriend, CSI Cody West. Life is finally looking up until the night she finds the body of an apparent hitman on the side of the road. As if that weren't bad enough, in his pocket is her sister's name and address. Has someone really put out a hit on sweet, lovable Ava? To keep her sister safe, Lily must once again use her sleuthing skills to unlock the mystery. Her search for answers takes her on a journey filled with family secrets, ghost seekers, organized crime, and more suspects than she can count. As the possibilities mount without any clear answers, time may be running out for more than just one of the Cranston sisters. You love them? Have you worn them? I have never worn them. Hammers and Homicide by Paula Charles. Recent sexagenarian widow Donna Carpenter thought running her own hardware store after the death of her husband was hard enough. With her adult daughter April moving back into town and Darlene, the annoying boutique owner next door to her shop, poking around, Donna has her hands full. But when she finds a dead man in the bathroom of her store with a framing hammer by his side, she's in way over her head. The victim, Warren Highcastle, was a land developer who was looking to purchase the old theater in town to build a new hotel. Donna and April, worried about the implications of the crime scene at the hardware store, put themselves on the case. They soon learned that Warren had made quite a few enemies in a short amount of time in town. As the suspect list starts growing, so too do the threats against Donna and April. Can Donna and April nail the killer before they strike again? Let's see. Let's open up a few more. I wish this website would get their links fixed, their pictures fixed. The Bistro at Holiday Bay. That is also a very pretty cover. Did I have the right persona to pull them off? <laughs> as long as they're birdie. Yes. Nice hat. A nice pair. Oh, nice. I've always wanted a pair of cowboy, cowgirl boots on my bucket list, I guess you could say. Someday I will succumb. Typing is a struggle today. I mean to say, yes, I had a couple of pairs. Speaking is also being a problem today. <laughs> I think we should all stay home and read. But, you know, when you're married to the boss, you don't get those kind of days. Uh, this is by Kathy Daly, six in the Bistro at Holiday Bay series, 160 pages. Shelby and gang at the Bistro have decided to ring in the new year with a huge celebration. The building had been decorated, a killer band had been hired, and everyone is looking forward to a fresh start and a new list of resolutions, including Amy, who has been working for weeks to replicate the ravioli soup her neighbor used to make each year for her New Year's Day dinner party. In spite of the positive energy created by the annual chance to reset and restart, a dark cloud settles over the festivities when Alex is handed a new case, a modern-day murder that ties into New Year's Eve murder Beck investigated five years ago. If you're looking for a seasonal type of book, we are. We could still say New Year's Eve is timely. A Very Tidy Death by Bonnie Hardy, sixth in the Lily Rock Mystery. Oh, this comes out January 30th. We will look at it later. Death at the Fireside Inn, first in the Veronica Vale investigations, set in 1920s by Kitty Kildare, 206 pages. A determined sleuth and a terrible crime. London, 1920. 
Veronica Vale is content with her obituary writing, parties with friends, and walks with her rescue dog, Benji. But when a shocking killing occurs at the Winter Garden Theater and Veronica knows the victim, she finds herself doing more than writing about the death. She in, she's investigating who done it and why. Veronica enlists her best friend, Ruby Smythe, and her street smart dog, Benji, to figure out what happened and get justice for the victim. Can our headstrong, clever amateur sleuth catch the killer before the police? And what secrets will she uncover when she does? Al Roker has... Didn't he already do these? Are these re-releases? I swear these are not new. Anybody know? Cajun, I'm reading a Christmas book now because it's next in line in the series. And the next is set at Mardi Gras. And I do want to read that from Mardi Gras. Very nice. Must be re-released. That's what I'm thinking because those have been out. The Bookseller Blunder by Kate Martin, third in the Wheel and Woe Bookshop Mystery, Bookshop Witch Mystery. That's a pretty cover. Green. Uh, Tabitha Green knows more about magic than most. She might not be able to cast a workable spell to save her life, but she has read every magical tome and text in existence, or so she thought. But then she hears of another book, a rare volume delineating an even rarer type of magic, a type of magic that just might be Tabitha's real calling. But when she tracks down the magical bookseller who owes, owns the only known copy, she finds only a dead shop owner and no sign of the book. Maybe a random robbery gone wrong, but Tabitha doubts it. But either way, she wants that book and she has to find the murderer first. As bookie monsters, we know this. We want, we have to get that book. With the help of her friends, she intends to do just that. But if the thief who stole the book, stole the book killed the bookseller in order to hide the truth the text contains, Tabitha and all her friends face a dangerous threat. Let's see. Let's try to get a couple more in if we can. Corpse in the Cafe, a French Quarter Mystery by Jen Pitts, sixth in the French Quarter Mysteries. February. Never mind. Murder in the Alps by Sarah Rosette, eighth in the 1920s, etc. Switzerland, 1924, Lady Sleuth Olive Belgrave is set to enjoy a holiday of ice skating and snowshoeing in the glamorous alpine setting of St. Moritz. But her plans are rudely interrupted when an unfortunate accident takes place. It quickly becomes clear that the tragic event was a carefully concealed murder. Olive isn't one to shy away from a challenge, and with her sharp intuition and knowledge of the high society set, she uncovers motives among the elite guests. However, this case is one of the most challenging she's faced. Her suspects include a famous lady mountaineer, an up-and-coming fashion designer, a mousy lady's maid, and several gentlemen sportsmen who seem to be only interested in tobogganing, ice climbing, and the new sport of skiing down the mountain slopes. Can Olive find the cunning killer and solve the impossible crime before it's too late? And that is also a pretty cover. Deadly to the Core by Joyce Tremel. Tremel Cider House Mysteries number one. After losing her husband in a terrible car crash, 30-year-old Kate is left to pick up the pieces of her life alone. Although she has physically recovered, she worries her spirit never will. But when she learns that she has inherited a fruit orchard in a small town just outside Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, with her great uncle Stan, from her great-uncle Stan, she takes this as an opportunity ripe for the picking. Kate knew immediately what to do with it, open a cider house. Her hopeful plans fall far from the tree. When she finds the body of the orchard manager, Carl Randolph, 
leaving her to figure out who is at the core of this murder. She has been in correspondence with Carl, who had agreed that her brilliant idea of opening a cider, who agreed with her brilliant idea of opening a cider house. Well, he knows where his money. Okay, never mind. But now, but not everyone is so quick to buy what she was selling. Uncle Sam's lawyer, Robert Larrabee, paints a less rosy financial outlook of the orchard's past, present, and future. Kate discovers that Carl had large unexplained deposits to his bank account, and it becomes clear that either he was blackmailing someone or someone was paying him to keep quiet. Meanwhile, Kate and her neighbors receive offers to buy their property from a mysterious buyer. And there's more than meets the eye with the neighboring orchard owner, Daniel Martinez, although Kate can't quite put her finger on if it's sweet or sour. Trust us, it's sweet. Not time for one more. Twinkle, twinkle, au revoir. Double check the date. Yep, we're good. By Heather Weedner, second in the Mermaid Bay Christmas Shop Mystery. Love is in the air when Hollywood arrives in Mermaid Bay and the town may never be the same. Fans will do almost anything to get a glimpse of the actors or a chance to be an extra in the love channels, the love channels. My coastal valentine. Crowds flock to the cozy beach town from all over and business is booming for Christmas shop owner Jack Hicks until the body of a testy reporter is found in one of the actor's rooms. And if murder isn't bad enough, someone tries to kill the show star, hunky Raphael Allard. The cozy little beach town feels cursed as the love channel threatens to pull out of the project. Jade and the gang, Lorelai, Peppermint Patty, Bernie, Chloe, and Neville the Devil Cat have to solve the crimes before it ruins the town's reputation and breaks the hearts of fans across the country. All right. Hello. Fine. I, bet we get I couldn't lose too. any weight, of no matter not. what I tried, but I couldn't figure out why. It's not even Mercury retrograde. All right. That's all we have time for. Sorry, there were some technical difficulties. They are already movies out. Wow. All right, guys. Hope you have a good Monday. Uh, no sprints tonight. Storm has them on her channel. Storm Reads, if you want to participate, they start at... 7 p.m. Eastern time. Um, otherwise, my next sprints are tomorrow evening at 6.05 Mountain Time, 8.05 Eastern. Uh, we do the, I do that every Tuesday, Thursday evening, and Saturday afternoon. Cajun says, hope everyone has a great day and stays warm and dry. You too, thanks. Great to see everyone, and we'll tune in tomorrow. Hope to see you later. We'll try to be a good girl. I know. I haven't seen a, a list yet, though. Stay warm and safe, everyone. Absolutely. Stay warm, stay safe, read good books, drink nummy things. And uh, as the banner says here, don't be a bookworm, be a bookie monster. Oh, no, no. Have a good day and God bless.